Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain! I can't hear you! Aye, aye, Captain! Oh! Do you consider SpongeBob to be an anime? Hear me out for a second. The word anime is a gaidaigo, a foreign borrowed word in Japanese that means animation in English. While most Westerners see anime specifically as a style of Japanese animation, or as a style of animation originating in Japan, the Japanese use the term anime to refer to all animated works, regardless of style or origin. So, how should English speakers define a term that originally came from English? According to my private Japanese teacher, SpongeBob is considered by the Japanese to be an eigo no anime, an American anime. I'd guess I'd have my answer if I was Japanese, but I'm not. I'm asking English speakers. Prior to the usage of the word anime, the term Japanimation was prevalent throughout the 70s and 80s. In the mid-80s, the term anime began to replace Japanimation. Because of this, it's clear why English speakers associate works originating from Japan to be anime and not other Western cartoons and animations like Disney. Just like how television became vastly successful in America following World War II, anime, the English perception of the word, and manga, Japanese comic books and graphic novels, began to flourish. Due to this, many define anime as any animation emanating from Japan after 1945. Animators of the time were bound by the limitations of the technology that they had. Each frame in an animation was hand-drawn, which is why limited animation became a popular process, where the animator reuses frames of character animation. Over the years, as technology evolved, what was once a hand-drawn animation style morphed into a partially computer-generated imagery CGI, style, and further into a fully CGI style. All of these examples are technically animations originating from Japan. But at what point in this evolution does anime cease to be anime? Or is it all still considered anime, just different types of anime? Anime wasn't the only piece of Japanese media that evolved. Video games also went through a drastic transformation over the last 50 years. As video game consoles became more advanced, so did the music that was written for them. They went from having severe technical limitations to virtually none at all. The same question can be asked regarding this other Japanese-related topic, chiptunes. If the same limitations aren't placed on the creator or composer, is a chiptune still a chiptune? Chiptunes get their name from a piece of hardware in early video game consoles called sound chips. The different type of sound chips include programmable sound generators, PSGs, that generate audio wave signals built through basic waveforms, synthesizers that generate complex waveforms through oscillators, and audio samplers that digitally represent sampled analog signals. For this discussion of chiptunes, we'll be focusing on PSGs and synthesizers, as they were the types of sound chips found in video game consoles that we associate with chiptune music. The central processing units, CPUs, of early video game consoles were technically capable of producing sound by creating click noises at precise moments to generate specific notes. The reason that the task of producing sound was placed on a separate piece of hardware, the sound chip, was so that 100% of the CPU's runtime could be spent running the more important elements of the game the in-game mechanics, controlling, and input-output operations. PSGs, on the other hand, generate audio wave signals built from basic waveforms such as square waves, triangle waves, and sawtooth waves. The number of channels that the sound chip has limit the number of concurrent sounds that can be played at once. While the number of channels in PSGs range from 1 to 8, most feature 4 channels three tone channels, and one noise channel. In some video game consoles, VGCs, each individual channel can only produce a specific waveform. Released in Japan in 1983, the Nintendo Entertainment System sound chip had five channels. The first two produced square waves, the third produced a triangle wave, and the fourth produced a noise wave. The fifth channel is an audio sampler that can play virtually any sound, including speech, in short bursts. Here are some examples from the NES.
other VGCs, like the Commodore 64, released in 1982, had three channels. All three channels were capable of producing square, triangle, sawtooth, and noise waves. Composers would use this ability of changing waveforms to create more unique sounding music than the NES could with two less channels. Here are some examples from the C64. You might be wondering why all five channels of the NES, or three channels of the C64, weren't all sampler channels. This is because of the limited memory that could fit onto the early ROM cartridges. The Nintendo Game Boy, the Game Boy Color, and the Game Boy Advance all use synthesizers as their sound chips. Similar to the PSG of the NES, the Game Boy and Game Boy Color both use synthesizers comprised of four channels. Two square wave channels, a channel for a programmable wavetable, and a noise channel. You can best relate the programmable wavetable to the audio sampling channel of the NES, a channel that is used by developers to add in unique sounds to their games. The Game Boy Advance primarily uses its more advanced 32-bit CPU to handle the audio output, but it still has the same sound chip to run Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. Video game consoles can be broken down into nine generations. Like how musical eras overlap, these VGC generations are separated by their hardware, rather than a firm point in time. We'll be specifically focusing on the first generation through some of the fifth, because of their limited 8-bit and 16-bit CPUs. Most fifth generation VGCs were 32-bit, but some of the handheld consoles, like the Game Boy Color, still used 8-bit CPUs. A binary digit, also known as a bit, is the most basic unit of information in computing. Bits are represented as a 1 or a 0, and a string of 8 bits is called a byte, hence 8-bit. Since 8-bit CPUs can only store and process a maximum of 8 bits per data block at a time, the quality of the audio and visuals are limited. The music that came from these 8-bit consoles are referred to as 8-bit music. As CPUs evolved, 16-bit CPUs created 16-bit music. The bit depth the number of bits of information in each sample varies between 8 bits and 16 bits. 8-bit music only uses 256 possible values to represent each music sample, while 16-bit music uses 65,536 possible values. 16-bit music offers a higher dynamic range and a more detailed representation of the original music than 8-bit music could. While a distinction can be made between 8-bit and 16-bit music, it's the audio wave signals that are generated using the sound chip that make it chiptune music. The composers of the chiptune era were limited by the technology available to them. Carson classifies these limitations into four categories. Timbre, the tone color, character, tone quality of each sound. Polyphony, the number of voices that could be played at the same time. Limited memory and storage capabilities that were available in a VGC and external factors, CPU speed and video display frame rates. All chiptunes have a distinct timbre associated with them due to all of them being comprised of square, triangle, sawtooth, and noise waves. This is much different than composing for a family of string instruments or a consort of brass instruments where each instrument can produce a multitude of different tones depending on how the instrument is played. Composers created more sounds by tricking the listener with audio illusions. These illusions were developed both intentionally and by trial and error. Examples include flanging, vibrato, gliding, and rapid modification, all of which create new tonal colors without going outside of the technical capabilities of the hardware. Since VGCs have a set number of channels, you can only have a few notes playing simultaneously. 
In many instances, one channel is dedicated to the percussive sounds, and another is for miscellaneous sound effects, jumping, hitting things, and obtaining coins. For example, this takes the five channels of the NES down to just three channels for notes. Composers worked around this limitation by writing quick arpeggios in place of sustained chords. This allowed melodies to run simultaneously with chords, even though only three notes are ever being played at one time. Take Metroid for example. Hirokazu Tanaka only used one channel to express chordal information, which left room for both a bass line and an ascending sound effect. Composers like Tim Follin use counterpoint to overcome this hardware limitation as well. This technique of combining different melodic lines led to more complex music like in Solstice. Apart from arpeggios and counterpoint, Composers frequently use church modes to help make their music stand out from all of the other three-voiced chiptunes. By moving away from the typical major and minor keys, composers can more accurately represent the situations that the video game characters encounter. From the funkiness of the Dorian mode to the arid desert vibe of the Locrian mode, the YouTube channel 8-Bit Music Theory has a whole series of videos where he brings attention to the usage of church modes in 8-Bit music. The memory of these 8-bit and 16-bit VGCs were incredibly small in comparison to the average internet download speed of 60 megabits per second. To put this into perspective, the capacity of an NES ROM cartridge is about 1 megabit. That means if you have an internet speed of 60 megabits per second, you're downloading the equivalent of 60 NES ROM cartridges in one second. Chiptune music was short and repeated to reduce the amount of memory used. CPUs were also limited by how much information they could process in a second. This is measured in hertz. The Intel Core i9, the most recent processor released by Intel, has a clock speed of 6 GHz per second. In comparison with the NES's 1.79 MHz, the Intel Core i9 can process digital information about 3,350 times faster than the NES. The smaller and more condensed the chiptune was, the easier it was for the NES's CPU to process. With these limitations and techniques in mind, it's clear that creativity was forced out of composers and developers to create interesting and unique music. The chip music community, also known as the chip scene, is a collective group of chiptune composers, artists, and fans. Just like how other game fans identify themselves as modders, laners, or hardcore gamers, many members of the chip music community identify themselves as chip tuners. The first generation of the chip scene began to flourish between the 1980s and 1990s with the emergence of tracking, cracking, and demo scenes. Trackers were chip tune artists that used sound trackers like the Ultimate Sound Tracker, built by Karsten Obarski in 1987, to create computer music. Crackers were programmers who removed copy protection from a software, most commonly video games, through a process called software cracking, also known as breaking. A cracked game allows someone to play a full version of a game without paying for a product key. Demos are computer programs that produce audiovisual presentations.
Both crackers and demo sceners use the sound tracker to compose background music for their crack intros and demos. As is the case with all other communities, subcultures began to arise within. The chiptune artists that created music through authentic practice used the same technology that original chiptune composers had available to them, and are bound to the same limitations as them. The chip music that is created using inauthentic technology is referred to as fake bit. Fake bit a portmanteau of fake and 8-bit refers to a style of electronic music that differs from real 8-bit music. Fake bit music is made with the technical resources of sound emulation, software synthesizers, or hardware synthesizers instead of authentic low-bit computers and gaming consoles. The Little Sound DJ, created by John Kotlinski in 2000, was a program that transformed the Game Boy into a full-fledged music workstation through a cartridge containing tracking software. The LSDJ gave composers access to the four channels of the sound chip on the Game Boy. This led to the chiptune subculture a scene that transcended the chiptune music itself. The difference between this subculture and other video game composers of the early 2000s is their devotion to old forms of gaming devices through playful exploration of their sound capabilities. By using the Game Boys and other retro VGCs themselves as the instruments, the chiptune subculture also embraced the 8-bit aesthetic of pixelated visuals. This combination of chiptune music and 8-bit visuals is what defines this chiptune subculture. The chiptune artists that use the same hardware, sound chips and CPUs, to create chiptune music are indisputably chiptuners. In a similar way that a performance of Baroque music played by period instruments is called performance practice or an authentic performance, they use authentic VGCs to accurately create stylistic music with the same limitations as the original chiptune composers that inspired them. What is notably different here is that these chiptuners used authentic hardware to create new music rather than reproducing the same exact music as the original chiptune composers. Would a more accurate description of this inspired chiptune music be called neo chiptune music? Just like how contemporary orchestras play Baroque music in their concerts with non-Baroque instruments, progressive chiptune artists create chiptune music with a different set of parameters. Fake bit artists write songs that sound like or pay homage to 8-bit music, but have not been created with original 8-bit hardware. Instead, they use modern hardware like DAWs to create contemporary chiptune music. This brings us to the last generation of the chip scene, appropriately named Chipsters because of their hipster attitude. This generation is defined by their trolling character, postmodern unconventional ideology, and co-optation of chip music and fake bit. Aside from the trolling that these chip singers did for fun, they also found themselves supporting unconventional beliefs, such as supporting the composition of chip music using modern computers, and following popular music aesthetics as opposed to those more materialist approaches. Chipsters find creative ways of combining avant-garde and subcultural elements in order to break through to mainstream audiences, a practice which is criticized by purists. From the perspective of trackers, crackers, and demo sceners, fake bit is not regarded as chip music. It is not composed using limited hardware or original VGCs, and is seen by the first generation as inauthentic. After the popularity boost in the 2000s from the second generation, Fakebit emulators encourage chip music enthusiasts to create chip tunes. To the second generation, this simplification of creating chip tunes became a characteristic of chip music authenticity. The third generation of chipsters 
found different ways to introduce chip music to mainstream audiences by using acoustic instruments, hardware, and computer software without being bothered by the criteria established by the first generation. This brings us back to the question, what is a chip tune? When I first started researching this topic, it seemed like a pretty straightforward answer to me. A chip tune is music composed for and played by a sound chip. The further I researched, I found that it became harder to answer what was once a simple question. Is it still a chip tune if it's not played through a sound chip? Is it still a chip tune if it has more than four channels? Is it a chip tune if it's combined with acoustic instruments? Maybe this all just demonstrates how complex topics really are when you take into consideration all of the viewpoints available. If you're asking me personally though, no, Spongebob is not an anime. <laughs>